The Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, if you're there, would you say amen? amen? All right, I want you, if you will, to look this way. If you think back to last Sunday morning, then you may recall last Sunday morning that I started a brand new series of messages that I've entitled, Does the Bible Really Say That? And as I said last Sunday morning, there are a lot of things, there's a lot of sayings, a lot of statements that people think are in the Bible when in reality they're not in the Bible. Last week I gave you a couple. Here's a couple of others. Have you ever heard anybody say this before? Look up on the screen. To thine own self be true. I've had people tell me, well, you know what the Bible said, to thine own self be true. Now I've got to stop and say I'm not even sure I even know what that means. Uh, to thine own self be true. Maybe it means to uh, be truthful with your own self. I, I, I don't know about all that, but I can tell you this. I've never read that statement in the Bible before. Now, I've read the Bible through a, a lot of times. I just recently finished up again for this year. I've started over again. So that's an ongoing process in my life. But I've never even read anything in the Bible that even comes close to that. To thine own self be true. A lot of people think that's in the Bible, but it's not in the Bible. Here's another one. My mama used to use this one on me all the time when it comes to cleaning my room. And she said, well, the Bible said cleanliness is next to godliness. Now, again, that really sounds like something that would be in the Bible. But you know, in reality, it's not in the Bible. Now, I know God wants us to live clean, to do right, make good choices. I get all that, and that helps us to stay close to God. But uh, uh, that statement itself is not found in all the 66 books, 1189 chapters, 31,000 plus verses. That one statement is never found in the whole Bible. You see, there's a lot of things that people think are in the Bible when in reality they are not in the Bible. But in this series, I'm flipping that around. I'm not talking about what's not in the Bible. I'm talking about what is in the Bible that people really don't know is in the Bible. Now, if you think back to last Sunday morning, I preached on this thought right here. Does the Bible really say there is a sin unto death? Does the Bible really say there is a sin? Now, of course, last week we discovered the fact that the Bible does say that for a child of God, for a member of the family of God, there is a sin unto death, a sin that will bring God's swift and sure judgment upon it. And we discovered last week that more than just an action, it's more or less an attitude, rebelling against God. Uh, you know, I'm talking about uh, rebelling and, and refusing to get right with God. And I think there are people in our Bible that we can say committed the sin unto death. They went so far away from God that God eventually said, that's enough, that's far enough, and God took them out of this world. We discovered last week there is, does the Bible really say there was a sin unto death? Absolutely. The Word of God affirms the fact, 1 John 5, verse 16, there is a sin unto death. Well, this morning, now I'm going to take this a step further. I really want you to listen this morning. I'm preaching this morning on this thought. Does the Bible really say there is an unforgivable sin? Now, you have heard it before, but maybe you've heard it in this kind of terminology. There, is there an unpardonable sin? Well, if you don't mind, I'm just going to stick with Bible language and I'm just going to preach on that thought. Is there, does the Bible really say that there is an unforgivable sin? Now, let me stop before I even get started with this and say the one thing that all of us can rejoice in and rejoice about is the fact that we're told over and over and over again in the Word of God that God can and God will forgive all sin. Can I have an amen? Now, I rejoice about that this morning, that God tells us in the Bible that he can forgive all sin. In fact, if you look up on the screen, look at this verse right here. Here's what the Bible said. Bless the Lord. Did they sing about that a moment ago? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then one of the very first benefits that is mentioned is this one right here, where the Bible said that God forgiveth how many of our iniquities? How many? 
all of thine iniquities. Now, we're told in the Bible that God can forgive all of our sin. What about this verse right here? Here's a good one, 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he, Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. We can fellowship with Jesus and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from, what's the next word? all sin. I'm so glad. I rejoice in the fact that there is a God big enough that there's not a sin that I can commit that is big enough that God cannot forgive. Can I have an amen? What about this verse right here? By the way, even in our text this morning, we have that. Let me read it to you. Look at verse 31. Wherefore, uh, Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. So there we have it again. Right there in the words of the Lord Jesus himself, he said all matter of sin and all matter of blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Now let's just stop a minute and say this. I don't know where you're at this morning, but I promise you this. We ought to be happy about the fact that our God can forgive all of our sin and he will forgive all of our sin. But we're not done yet. Because this same text goes on to talk about a sin that is unforgivable. Now, wait a minute. How can we say that? How can we say God forgives all sin, and yet there is one sin that not even God will forgive? Now, look at me. How can we say that? The answer to that is this. I didn't say it. Jesus did. I didn't say that. The Lord Jesus himself said, there is a sin that has no forgiveness. Now, what is it? Look at verse number 31. Let's read verse... Can I back up and read verse 30? The Bible said this, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Can I just stop and say, and according to that verse right there, there is no neutrality when it comes to Jesus. No neutrality. You're either for him or you're against him. You either are gathering with him or you're scattering abroad. There is no neutrality when it comes to Jesus. Well, somebody said, you know, preacher, I just want to tell you, I haven't accepted Jesus yet, but I just want you to know I am not against him. Well, that's not what the Bible said. The Bible said if you're not for him, say it with me, you're against him. If you're not gathering with him, you're scattering abroad. Listen, there's no land of neutrality. There's no place that you and I can say, I'm not going to make a decision about Jesus right now. I just haven't decided to follow him. Let me tell you something. If you haven't decided to follow him, then you've decided to reject him. Can I have an amen? It's like you're laying in the bed and the alarm clock goes off. Whatever time you get up, say 6 o'clock in the morning, and the alarm clock goes off and you reach over and you cut it off and then you say to yourself, I don't know if I want to get up yet or not. Wait a minute, you've already made your choice. For crying out loud, you're still laying in the bed. That's the way it is with Jesus, friend. If you haven't decided to follow him, guess what? You've rejected him. Now look at verse 31. All manner... Uh, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. I, I rejoice in that. But, now we turn the corner. The blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoso speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. There you have it. Jesus said there is a sin that can be committed that there is no forgiveness for. In fact, Jesus went on to say this. Not only if this sin is committed, uh, can it not be forgiven, but he goes on to add emphasis to the seriousness of it, and he says it won't be forgiven in this world, and it will not be forgiven in the world to come. So if I'm understanding this correctly, and y'all help me with this, uh, if I'm understanding this rightly, there is one sin that can be committed, which if it is committed, there's no hope of it ever getting right with God. Not in this world, not in the world to come.
Now, you're probably sitting there thinking to yourself, okay, preacher, tell us what that sin is. I want to be sure that I have not committed that sin. So here's where I'm beginning with all of this this morning. You know, sometimes when your car tears up or whatever, and you take it to a mechanic, and uh, he doesn't know exactly what's wrong with your car. He begins the process of troubleshooting that thing. In other words, of course, in our day, they can hook them up to them computers and just tell you right off the bat what's wrong with it. But used to, uh, in years bygone, if something was wrong with your car, they'd say, well, why don't we start with this? And we'll see if this is it. If it's fixed, if it don't, then we've eliminated that. We'll move on to something else. Sometimes when you go to the doctor and you've got a pain, maybe somewhere in your body, and you say, doctor, I'm hurting right here. And he says, okay, if you're hurting in your side, let's first of all, let's just eliminate your appendix. Let's just get that out of the way. Let's do some blood work. And if that's not it, we'll explore a little bit deeper. And through the process of elimination, they eventually find out what is exactly wrong with you. Well, this morning, what I want to do is I want to eliminate some sins that we can set aside and say, okay, that is not the unforgivable sin. There may be somebody sitting in this room this morning who thinks to themselves, you know something? I'm not sure. I may have committed the unforgivable sin. So what I've done this morning is I wrote down, and I think I did eight or nine of them, eight or nine sins that you can just set aside. You may have committed some of these sins. Hope you've not committed any of them. Uh, but if it, you may be thinking this morning, you know, I've done this, I've done that I may have committed the one unpardonable sin. So I want to set all that aside this morning and say, okay, that's not it. Let's come to the meat, the crux of the matter. Are you with me? Can I have an amen? So what is, maybe somebody comes up to you tomorrow and say, I'll tell you, I think I've committed the unforgivable sin. You can say, well, what is it? And if they tell you, then according to this list right here that I'm about to give you, we can check off some things that's not the unforgivable sin. Now, bear with me this morning. It's going to take me just a minute to get through this list. First of all, let me say, number one, that adultery is not the unforgivable sin. Now, i got to stop and tell you, adultery is a wicked sin. Can I have an amen? It is a sin. Look at me. It is a sin against God, and it is a sin against your spouse, and it is a sin against your your family, and it is a sin against this church. It is a sin against the Bible for anybody to become unfaithful to their spouse. Can I have an amen? You know, the Bible still says, thou shalt not, Exodus 20, 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. The Bible still says that. By the way, did you know back in 1631, there was a Bible that was published back in those days that became known as the Wicked Bible. And, and, and they, they gathered them all up. Let me just say this. They gathered them all up and they burned every one of them with the exception there are still 11 of those so-called Wicked Bibles that you can still purchase today. One was just recently purchased online. Uh, one is in a museum up in Washington, D.C. They estimated over $500,000 and it's referred to as the Wicked Bible. And the reason that it's called the wicked Bible is because the omission, the omission of one word and that one word that was omitted from the Bible, it's not God's fault, it was the publisher's fault, but they omitted the word not from Exodus 20, 14. And it says this, thou shalt commit adultery. Now I'll tell you, I think that's a, the Bible a lot of people are reading in our day. Because I'm telling you some people take marital vows at the altar. Uh, Elijah and Miss Madison got married yesterday. I think that's number nine or ten for this year. I've still got a couple of more to marry. One this weekend, one a little bit later on. And uh, man, the one thing I always try to spend when we get to those vows, man, these vows are promises. You're not just making them before a group of people. You're not just standing before a preacher. Hey, you're standing before God Almighty when you're saying, there's nobody else in this world for me. I stress to every young couple that I talk to, and I'm not down on anybody in this room that's been divorced. I'm not down on you at all, but I'm here to tell you this. There's no plan B when it comes to marriage. Now, I know people marry, they divorce. I get all that, but I want these young couples to know, all right, man, if you think there's a plan B, then look at me. Take the dress back, bless your heart. Get your money back, cancel the cake, call the flowers off, because I want you to know, as a people of God, there ain't no plan B to this thing. 
And the truth of the matter is when you stand before God Almighty and say, okay, there's nobody else in this world for me, and then you go out and commit adultery, you've lied to God. You have lied to Almighty God. That's right, friend. And I'm telling you, this stuff is rampant in our society today. I mean, this flirtation, innocent flirtation, and this adultery stuff that's going on in our world today, I'm just here to tell you, it's wicked, it's against God, it's a sin against your spouse, it's a sin against your... You might as well, if you go out and commit adultery, you might as well look at your children and just say to them and say to your spouse, my personal satisfaction means more to me than you do. Do. Now that's pretty hard to take, but I'm willing to back it up. And if that makes you mad, you meet Brother Brian back out back of the church five minutes after service this morning. But that's what you're saying. Can I have an amen? But can I got some good news for you? If you've done that, as wicked and as ungodly as it may be, I'm glad I can tell you there's sure is some hope for you. Because God can. Forgive the sin of adultery. We have a huge illustration of that in our Bible in the form of a man after God's own heart, King David. King David committed adultery with another man's wife. And yet, after committing adultery, becoming unfaithful to his spouse, and committing adultery, here's what God said to King David. David, uh, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord, and Nathan, the prophet, the man of God said, hey, I just want to tell you, the Lord hath also put away thy sin. I don't know who I may be speaking to here this morning, and maybe you become unfaithful in your marital relationship. And that's wicked, that's ungodly, and you ought to get that right with God. I'm telling you, you ought to get that right with God this morning. But that is not the unforgivable sin. Adultery can be forgiven. There's a second sin I want to mention this morning, and that's this one the sin of murder. Now, years ago, we were out witnessing one day and we run across this, this old World War II veteran. And uh, we knocked on his door and we were witnessing to him and uh, we brought him to that point and I said, sir, you know, you don't have to be in church to be saved. You can get saved right here in your own living room if you'd, uh, if you'd be willing to accept Jesus as your Savior. You can be saved here today. And he said, it's too late, preacher. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you don't understand. Back during the days of World War II, I was over uh, in Okinawa. And while I was there, he said, I shot and killed several men. And he said, there's no hope for the sin of murder. I told that dear brother, can I tell you something? Murder is wrong. It is a sin in the sight of God. If you're doing it for your country because in a time of war, that's a whole different matter. But I'm here to tell you that God can and God will. And I hope nobody in here has ever murdered anybody. I don't think so. <laughs> I hope not. Some of you, I'm a little scared. but You know something? Murder can be forgiven. The Apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus before he became Paul, was either directly or indirectly responsible for the killing of many of God's people. He just didn't murder thieves and, and, uh, and re uh, re those who are rebellers. He just didn't murder. He murdered God's people. In fact, here's what he said in his own words. Saul, who became Paul, was consenting unto his death. Now, wait a minute. Who's that talking about? That ain't talking about a criminal on a cross. That's talking about the deacon of a church. And the Bible said that they killed one of the first deacons of the, of the church. His name was Stephen. They stoned him to death. And the Bible said that Saul gave his permission. He was indirectly involved with the murder of, of, of the deacon by the name of Stephen. Saul was consenting unto his death. He was standing there. He held the coats of those who stoned that man of God. He was, he was responsible for the death of another man. And yet, years later, Paul said this. I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But Paul said, thank God, I got mercy for it. I may be speaking to somebody, hope I'm not. Somebody in this room that may have took, a, that took the life of another person. And as bad as that may be and the guilt and all that goes along with that, I just want to tell you that is not the unforgivable sin. So now we've ruled out adultery. We can set that one down. We've ruled out murder. Let's set that one down. 
Now let's rule out another one, and that's suicide. Now I want to tell you something. There are five people in our Bible. You read through the Bible, there are five people in the Word of God that committed suicide. I mentioned Saul a moment ago, fell on his own sword. I mean, just took his own sword and just fell on it, committed suicide. Judas, we're familiar with that, hung himself. We, we, we're familiar with that. Samson pushed the pillars down, remember? And the building come crumbling down on top of him. There was Ahithophel, the counselor of David, who hung himself. There was Abimelech, who uh, a woman cast a rock down upon him and hit him in the head and he was mortally wounded. And as he lay dying, he said, look, I don't want people telling me, uh, telling everybody that some woman killed me. Take your sword, take my sword. And he took his sword and run it through him, committed suicide. But I got news for you, friend. Suicide can, is not the unforgivable sin. Now, you, I want you to look this way. Look at me. I'm not encouraging anybody in here. If you didn't think about it, just go and do it. God will forgive you for it. 10,000 times no. I'm telling you, suicide is a terrible, it's a terrible, terrible thing. When a child of God commits suicide, what we're literally saying, as bad as it is, we're literally saying that God cannot even help me with my problems. That my problems are too big even for God to bear. The same God that said, cast your burdens upon me and, and, and I will sustain you because I care for you. That God tells us that. And when a Christian takes their own life, I'm telling you, that's a terrible thing. We're telling the world, not even God can handle what's going on in my life. I'm looking for a way out. But as bad as that may be, can I tell you something? That is not the unforgivable sin. You may tell you why? Suicide is self-murder. Murder can be forgiven. Suicide can be forgiven. Now, here's what I personally think about that. I think if a Christian commits suicide, I think of the judgment seat of Christ. They've lost every reward that they may have ever had while they labored and lived for the Lord down here on this earth. I think they'll make it into heaven. I think they'll make it in yet so is by fire, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.15. But I'm just here to tell you, friends, suicide is not the unforgivable sin. Somebody said, he took his own life. He's in hell forever. Where do you read that at in the Bible? That ain't the Bible. Now, don't go do it. I'm not saying it's okay. But I'm just saying that's not. Can I have an amen? I'm a little nervous. Y'all making me nervous this morning. Suicide is not the unforgivable sin. So that's, is that three? Number four, homosexuality. Now, we live in a culture today that is, uh, and a society today that has embraced this. Our own, our own nation has stamped his approval upon that against the, the word of God. We know that. We're God's people. We believe the Bible. We believe that God's word, uh, in the word of God, we find that marriage is between a man and a woman. Now y'all really making me nervous now. I'm, I'm totally, give me a Xanax. You got some. Oh, brother. Marriage is a man and a woman. Can I have an amen? And God's never deviated from that original plan. And, and, and in our culture today, it's been embraced. And it's being shoved down our throats as the people of God. And we're just being told, look, you homophobic. You get over. What, and all of that. I get all that. But I want to tell you something. Homosexuality is a sin. But it's not the unforgivable sin. You remember that long list in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Now, I get it. I know what Paul uh, said in Romans chapter 1 about the reprobate mind. I get all that, but I do know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 too when he said this in verse, in verse 11. He said, such were some of you. And he's talking and he gave that long list and he's going down through there and he talks about and one word in particular that he mentions is the word effeminate. And he said, and such were some of you. You used to be like that. But what happened? But now you're washed. Washed in what? Tide? Gain? No, sir. Washed in the blood of Jesus. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of our... I'm just here to tell you, friend, as bad as that may be, that's not the unforgivable sin. How many of you are with me now? Is that four or five? Number five. Cursing, I want to use the word blasphemy. Cursing, even taking God's name in vain, is not the unforgivable sin. Now we're told in the book of Exodus, if you want to look up on the screens, we're told in the book of Exodus, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. 
For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Cursing, blasphemy. That's terrible. Taking God's name in vain. That's awful to do something like that. You know, cursing, profanity, blasphemy is one of the stupidest sins that anybody can ever commit. And I mean that for this reason. Hang on. But when you steal something, at least you get what you've stolen till the police catch you. So if you steal a hood cap off a car, at least you can play Frisbee till the police come and catch you with it. If you steal, if you steal a freezer full of meat, at least you get some meat to eat until they catch up with you. When you steal, at least you get something. What do you get when you cuss? <laughs> nothing. You get in trouble with God and you get nothing in return. It's a stupid sin. And the Bible warns us, whatever we do, don't take the name of the Lord our God in vain. Don't do that. And yet, Jesus said in this same verse, verse 31, all manner of sin and blasphemy. He said, you can speak a word against the Son of God and it'll be forgiven. And I got proof when Jesus was hanging on Calvary, they said some tough things about him when he was on the cross. You remember those things they said? You be the Christ, save thyself. And that's what one of the thieves said. Uh, uh, another standing crowd said, uh, let, let, let loan, let loan. Let him see if Elijah will come and save him. They, they called him a liar and a lunatic. Uh, they did not trust him as a the, as the Lord. And yet, while hanging there on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Forgive the mob, forgive the multitude, forgive the malefactors, all this they're saying. Father, forgive them. I got news for you, and I hope you haven't done this, but you may have used God's name in vain, but I'm here to tell you, that's not the unforgivable sin. That's not the unforgivable sin. Number next, denying Jesus is not the unforgivable sin. Peter denied the Lord three times. Remember the story? And I know there's a verse in our Bible that said, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my... I get all that. It's in the Bible. But I also know that Peter denied that he knew the Lord three times. said, I don't even know him. And the last time he started cursing and blaspheming and said, I know not the man. Remember that? And yet look at this verse right here. After Jesus resurrected from dead, he said, you go your way and you tell his disciples. And uh, you include Peter in that as well. And the next thing we know, Peter standing up on the day of Pentecost preaching and 3,000 folks walked down the aisle and got saved. A little bit later, he's preaching again on Solomon's porch and 5,000 more got saved. Evidently, denying Jesus is not the unforgivable sin. Number next. Addiction is not the unforgivable sin. There are all kinds of addictions in our day. There's drugs, porn, alcohol, gambling. I mean, man, there's all kind of stuff that people are in bondage to in our world today. Would you agree with me when I say that somebody who's addicted to something is being held captive by whatever it is they're addicted to? It's that they're in captivity. Bible word, they're in bondage to that. Can, would you say amen to that? They're in bondage. They're a captive to whatever that is, whether it be meth or coke, cro, uh, co, co, uh, cocaine or alcohol or pornography or gambling or whatever it might be. They're being held captive. They're in bondage to it. And yet we read this about the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. The Lord, Lucifer, the prisoners. Can I tell you something? Addiction. That is not the unforgivable sin. And then look at this one. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin. You know, the one thing we know that, uh, about divorce is that God hates divorce. God hates divorce. You say, preacher, where does it say that in the Bible? Malachi 2.16 For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth, and then termin Bible terminology, putting away our terminology, God hates divorce. Now he doesn't hate people who are divorced, but he hates 
divorce. God hates what divorce does to people. He hates what it does to individuals. He hates what it does to children. He hates what it does to uh, the home. God hates divorce. It's unbelievable. I mean, God hates it. And I know I'm speaking to a room full of people. A lot of people in our church here, uh, people have been divorced. And I think you will agree with me when I say this, but you probably, if you'd be honest, would say, I wish it never would have happened. I wish it would have worked out. We could have been happy. Uh, our lives could have been together. We could have lived in harmony. It didn't work out. I was divorced. I get all that. But let me just tell you something. Guess what? God divorced his own people. You say, preacher, you shouldn't say that about God. I didn't. God said it. Look at this verse. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a what? God said, when I saw what they were doing with these other gods, you see in the Bible, God is like unto a husband to the nation of Israel and they're his earthly bride. And God said, when those people begin to go and bow at the altars and commit adultery and whoredoms with false gods, God said, I took it up here and I just put her away. I gave her a bill of divorce. God divorced. And before you get too high and mighty, I just want to remind you, God divorced his own people. That's pretty tough, ain't it? God said, here you go. Here's your, here's your bill of divorce. But later on, here's what God said about it. Look at this. Hosea 8 of verse 11. Because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be a sin unto him to sin. And in that same chapter, God said, I can't give them up. God said, here's your divorce papers. I don't want anything else to do with you. And then God got to thinking about it and said, I can't give you all up. I can't give you up. I love you too much. I can't give you up. And then he went on to say this in the same book of Hosea. Remember Hosea's wife, Gomer? Wouldn't you hate to be married to a woman named Gomer? Would you not hate to say, uh, I'm, hey, I'm Bill Johnson and this is my wife, Gomer? Holy smoke. What's people go? The Lord said unto me, this is to Hosea, go yet. Love a woman who had become unfaithful and was laying around with all kind of lovers. Laying around with all kind of people. He said, go yet love her. She might be an adulteress, but according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel who love to look to, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine, God said, Hosea, just as I love Israel, you go get your wife, bring her home. I said all oh, I'd say that. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin. I could mention the Elizabeth Taylor of the Bible. You know Elizabeth Taylor is mentioned in the Bible? John chapter 4, she'd been married five times. She was the Elizabeth Taylor before it was cool to be Elizabeth Taylor. She'd been married five times. She was living with number six. I mean, man, she had a track record. When she went back to town to tell people what Jesus had done for her, she had to go tell the men. She couldn't tell the women. The women didn't want anything to do with her. And yet, because she went back, began to tell everybody, look at this verse right here, John 4, 39. Many of the Samaritans in that city believed on him, on Jesus, for the saying of the woman that had been married five times and was living with number six. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin. All right, look this way. So we preached the whole message to give to this thought. Then preacher, if adultery and murder and addiction and suicide and divorce and whatever else I said... If that ain't it, what is the unforgivable sin? Look at me. Join me next week. <laughs> and I'm going to lay out for you what is the one sin, the only sin that God will not forgive. Now look this way and we're done. You know, many of us sit in this room today and I'll tell you it's... Uh, our lives are, are all messed up. I heard about this story this week about this young soldier. He was in the, in the army back during the days of the Civil War between the states. And being young and being in that kind of environment, that atmosphere, he had uh, become to live a very wicked and a very sinful life. And one, during one of those battles, now listen to me, don't, don't, don't cut me off yet. I know I am probably made you mad there, but it's okay. Come back next week. I'm trying to get you back. You know what that's called? Job security. <laughs> so you'll come back next week now. It's job security. And this young man, 
lived a very sinful and wicked life. And during one of those battles, he was mortally wounded and he lay dying on the battlefield. And as he lay there dying with open wounds and his, the, 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 his life blood draining slowly out of his body, a chaplain came by and saw him in that condition. And he said, son, listen now, son, is there anything I can do for you? And the young man in a very weak and somber voice said, no, sir, there's nothing you can do for me. What I need is someone who can undo some things for me. And ladies and gentlemen, I told you that story to tell you this. Jesus is the great undoer. And you may be in a mess. And you may be involved in six of those, those eight things that I just mentioned. You may be involved in seven of them. Or three or four of them or two. You may be involved in... But can I tell you, you say, Preacher, I'm in a mess. I want to get out of the mess. Jesus is the great undoer. And the Bible said in verse 31, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. You're guilty of those things? That's not unforgivable. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth from all sin. You come to Him today. Hey, He can make you right in the sight of God through His blood. Let's bow our heads for prayer.